Hi, Courtney. Hello. <laughs> Welcome everyone. to this week's Nikkei block party, week five. Week uh, five, we have four left after this. <laughs> hard to believe. And we have a really great show lined up for you all this evening. Oh, my dad is sitting next to me, but he's not going to join the stream. <laughs> Hi. Hello. <laughs> yes. Anyway, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, we have some wonderful artists here tonight. I'm going to introduce our first two poets, um, and we'll hear some of their original work shortly afterwards. So we're going to start with Greer Nakadagawa Lee, who is a 16-year-old and a rising junior at Oakland Technical High School. Greer has written a poem every day for over two years, and she is the 2020 Oakland Youth Poet Laureate. Her first chapbook, called A Heart Full of Hallways, is out now with Nomadic Press. So we are absolutely delighted to be able to feature three of Greer's poems. Thank you so much, Greer. Um, and at, right after Greer, we'll hear again from a beloved Tadaima and Nikkei Block Party artist, Kurt Ikeda. Um, I'm not sure that we actually read Kurt's bio last time, so I'm just going to give him a quick oh, shout out yeah, um, please do. now so we can know more about him. So Kurt is Hawaii born and raised in the South Bay of Los Angeles, and Kurt is Shin Nisei, second generation <laughs> Japanese American poet. He serves as the educational specialist for the Southern Idaho National Parks. Um, which are Craters of the Moon National Monument and Preserve, Hagerman Fossil Beds National Monument, and Minidoka National Historic Site. And Kurt is the descendant of Crystal City Camp survivors. So thank you so much, Greer and Kurt. And we are so looking forward to sharing your poetry with our audiences. Hey, everyone. Thank you guys so much for inviting me to participate in this event. And thank you, Lauren, for having me here, especially. Uh, so I have three poems I'm going to share with you guys today. Um, the first one I wanted to share because I, like, I really like how this event is trying to connect people to their heritage because, like, my Japanese ancestry and, like, that kind of culture is something I've felt really disconnected from uh, growing up in America. And that's what this poem is about. It's called Tourist. As if my whole body is just surface. As if I could peel away my skin. As if I could strip away. As if removing parts would somehow make me into who I was always meant to be. A child of spirit. A child of trees flowering out of my fingernails, rows of classrooms, rows of offices all stacked up in my straight spine. A child of a nation, a child whose body is a nation. I want to be who I was always meant to be. Some days I am all body. I am all stomach, all knuckles and knees and dead skin, 
Other days, I am the great granddaughter of a country in which I am a tourist, I could say. I'm just an American tourist in Japan, but that's not the full story. The truth is I am always a tourist in my own body. And America, her soil knows this about me, that I am not a child of spirit, that I am flesh and blood and hers in all my colors. And despite it all, I do not think she wants me if I'm like this. Even though generations of my family have made me America's daughter, I still cry for phantom limbs. I still hurt as though my skeleton belongs somewhere else for countries I can never call home. Sometimes I feel more split than mixed. Explosions defining the strongest borders in my blood. And in this way, I am a child of nations. In this way, my body understands more about history than I ever will. Thank you. Um, my second poem is more, I guess, generally about like, the historical experience of um, the people who were sent to the, inter the, to the internment camps. Um, because uh, my grandfather was in one of the internment camps for a time, I didn't really get a chance to um, ask him about his experiences before uh, he passed away, but I, yeah, I wanted to write this poem anyway. Um, it's called Plaything. If I kick you out of the stores, if I spit on your name, if I leave graffiti on your walls, if I dismantle your face into propaganda, if I force you to pack your life into garbage bags as if to show you just how much I value it, will you bear it? Will you still let me call you my children afterwards? If I suffocate you in wire, will you still fight my wars for me? If I treat you like animals, will you try to make your hands more human? Will you make crafts with them, play baseball, try to convince yourself things could be worse? Does it bother you that when I teach your grandchildren what I did to you, that I will use my calmest tone of voice? that I will emphasize the sounds of running water or chuckling through the thin walls. I will talk about what a stoic prisoner you were. If I wind you up now, do you still smile? Do you still march around the room? If I pick you up now, do you still hang your arms limp? Will you let me put your body on the operating table? Let me keep the parts of you I want to play with. Thank you. Um, this is my last poem. It's not, it's more about like the civil rights crisis that um, America is going through now and less about um, the Japanese American experience because, well, God knows America still doesn't know how to treat its own people. Like, so yeah, this is called Fourth of July. I have self-inflicted bruises and someone is playing 4th of July music, but I hope not. Because who still loves this country so much that they would kiss it at a funeral, that they would dance with it on top of someone's gravestone, and the hissing starts, outside, inside my body. Don't you love your country? The one your ancestors worked so hard to get you to, your childhood home your dreams of its cities, all the people in it that you love. But America is also hunting dogs and police picking people bloody off the vine just because they can. It is negligent capitalism that builds safety nets for billionaires breaking the ground beneath us. There's that hissing again. You love it here. You love it. Yes, I love the restaurants in Oakland Chinatown that people still won't go to anymore because they've fallen for snake oil salesman myths about immigrants and disease. Yes, I love looking at the houses in SF that hardly anyone can afford to live in anymore. Yes, I have self-inflicted bruises. Little pitfalls of love for a country that doesn't know how to treat its own people. And I want to have a million holidays for all those little loves. 
but I don't need even one for this broken place I call home. Thank you guys so much for having me here. Who forced us here? And what was our crime? When they finally let us free, where will we rebuild our lives? Ask why, Nise, why? How will you remember this camp when it's 25 years behind? Who told you of Thule Lake? What's left of Manzanar in 1969? When we first pilgrimaged to hidden histories, where was found in the heart and not the mind? Ask why, Sanse, why? How will you remember these confinement sites when they're 75 years behind? Whoever you journey for, whatever's in your grief case, emotional baggage can confine. Whenever you are ready, wherever is tagged and carried, that is why. Answer forever, Yonse, forever. How will we carry these stories when they're 100 years behind? My who, my Ojija. My what, the stories he never told me. My when is now. My where, Santa Anita and Crystal City. My why, because never again is now. Now how will you keep it going? How will you pass it on? For camp pilgrimages are letters. So return to sender, for our ancestors are our chaperones. Hi, my name is Curdy Keita and I'm the Education Specialist for the Southern Idaho National Parks, including Minidoka National Historic Site. You might remember me from poems such as Japanese American Sandlot and Minidoka on my mind from last year's pilgrimage. Well, today, I wanted to start this week's Nikkei block party with a poetry project filmed by Greg of the Japanese American Memorial Pilgrimages in front of the late Valerie Otani's Voices of Remembrance at the Portland Expo Center, formerly the Portland Detention Center. My poem, Pilgrimages in Five W's, Who, What, When, Where, and Why, is the first in a series of poetry inspired by my identity as a camp descendant and my time as a high school English teacher and poetry coach in Los Angeles. Now, the next two poems are written in styles that you, the viewer, can create poems out of. That's right, I want you to write poetry with me as we jump into five more weeks of this awesome virtual pilgrimage. I hope you use poetry as a way to process your experience. The first is a found poem. Found poetry is like a literary equivalent of a collage. You start with a text, a letter, a document, a poem even. You refashion, reorder, and represent the words by omitting a few and adding a few to form a new text, a poem. With this week's theme of what is citizenship, I chose this document for my found poem. It's a letter addressed to Eleanor Roosevelt by the Mother's Society of Minidoka in 1944. A group of over 100 Issei women signed a letter petitioning against the draft of their Nisei sons until their civil liberties were restored. Mind you, this draft is after the mothers determined that Minoru Yasui's original written letter written on their behalf wasn't radical enough. In Relocating Authority, Professor Mira Shimabukuro writes about the mothers. They disregarded the fact that petitioning the government was not a right afforded to them as non-citizens. And they addressed their letter petition not only to the First Lady, but to the President, Director of Minidoka, the director of all the WRA camps, and the Secretary of War. Dear 
Mother's Society of Minidoka. Dear America, we the parents of Americans, no less than any other American, we, the hyphen Americans, scripted out. Unfortunately, America, we stand on decades of toil and suffering, treatment far worse than an evacuation. A blow to their spirit, they suffer something that we bear witness again, using a baseless and vague argument. Fueling people to break, not a single case even, but unfortunately, the American public does not listen to the truth, and it seems that the discrimination against them is becoming even more intense. Even today, they are not allowed free travel through the United States for the purpose of protection. We advise them that they should submit and endure whatever place they are. Among them, some who show spirit coarse by their state of constant anguish. We understand that the purpose today is to establish freedom and equality throughout the world. B L M. As mothers, past and future, feel an extreme and unbearable anguish, please understand the feeling of the small number of suffering mothers until they regain the confidence of the United States. We earnestly and humbly await a reply from you. Respect your mother. Dear mothers of this nation, see that bitterness will pass. Justice, no matter what. Very sincerely yours, had to leave before signing. If you like that poem, check out Denali Moore's found poem, classified ads for the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation. Now, so maybe you don't want to work off of somebody else's writing. That's fine. Maybe you want to write your own poem. As you go through our virtual pilgrimage, think about the five W's. Most importantly, why? I mean, why? Why did we create and curate this virtual pilgrimage? And why do you watch over 150, yeah, individual videos from Tsukimono to Nono's? I mean, you sit and gestate and ferment on grief with hearts as heavy as mountains. You reminisce on happiness like finding love aboard a pilgrimage bus. This is us, our history, like rose thorns the size of short swords. 150 years ago, now cut in half, are these stories just buried pasts, like heirlooms, passed down to the ground like gunmen Are we just digging up sadness? Or are we bonsai pruning the media panic with question and answer panels with our wonderful elders and sharing warm meals for Sunday supper? So kanji leads songs so we can sing along in harmony. You do ukulele strums out of tune but think thoughtfully. Our community's legacy is increasingly aging and honestly, that's why Tadaima seems to be calling me. I mean, you could be watching Hamilton right now. But how lucky we are to be alive right now, together on a virtual pilgrimage bus side by side, telling stories to each other. So here's one last poem. The I carry poem is something that I wrote so that you too can try this at home. Honestly, this poem is as easy as answering a few questions. Where do you call home? What places do you pilgrimage to? What is something your family has left behind? Who do you pilgrimage for? This poem is based on George Ella Lyons' Where I'm From poem and the fill in the blank I Am From poem template by Levi Romero. Only what you can carry. Where are you from? 
Torrance, California. <laughs> no, really. Where are you from? I'm from the Pacific sea breeze, the peach trees with busy bees whose long gone limbs I remember as if they were my own. Only a butterfly crest necklace. What daddy left for me remembers that you can carry home. I carry my pens and papers, pencils and erasers from the house with a gunshot wound below my mother's windowsill. I carry umeboshi plums, homemade bentos, and lactate pills. On hot summer days at Rite Aid, also, I carry nammyo horengekyo on Sundays. I carry tadaima, I'm home, and okaeri, welcome home. Only my parents' parents and their parents, who are memories now, knows that you can carry a tune in two tongues where I'm from. I carry Honolulu and Sakata, Gardena and Minidoka. I carry my fiance. And the 22nd of August, 2022, I carry Miyake and Okushiba, Yokoyama and Ikeda. I carry cities made of crystals and mountains made of hearts. I pilgrimage to you. From Obachan, riding her tricycle to dialysis, to Mama and her sister by her side when she died, I carry, it can't be helped, shikataranai. Only what you can't hear is the ring of Grandma's rice cooker when the cooking is done. I carry this in my heart. So when you ask me where I'm from, Know that I carry fermented love. Now, where are you from? So, what do you carry on your pilgrimage? Check out the link on this video to access the only what you can carry poem template, along with guiding questions. We also have a printout version ready for you. For the poem, please visit tinyurl.com forward slash I carry pilgrimage poem. I really hope that you'll consider submitting your own I carry poem to Tadaima Community Archives on the Japanese American Memorial Pilgrimages website. For the community archive, please visit www.jampilgrimages.com forward slash community hyphen archive. Check it out. For more info. I sure hope that you take some time to write your own poem and share your reflections on why you pilgrimage. All right, that's my time. Please enjoy the rest of the Nikkei Block Party Week 5, and up next is my friend Brandon Shimoda. Wow, thank you so much, Kurt. Um, and as Kurt mentioned that tiny URL, we did drop it in the, the YouTube chat earlier. So please do consider writing your own poem. And if you're comfortable submitting it to the community archive, um, we'd really love to read your thoughts. I also wanna thank our youth committee, the Tadaima Youth Committee called Nikkei Rising for facilitating um, Greer's presence and, and her poetry. That was such a powerful way to begin this week. And now it is absolutely my pleasure to introduce Brandon Shimoda. Brandon Shimoda is, hi Brandon, um, hi. the author of several books, most recently The Grave on the Wall, which was published by City Lights in 2019 and received the PEN Pen Open Book Award and The Desert, which was published in 2018 by The Song Cave. Brandon's writings on Japanese American incarceration have appeared in the Asian American Literary Review, The Nation, and The New Inquiry. He is also the curator of the Hiroshima Library, an itinerant collection of books on the atomic bombing, bombings excuse me, of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which is currently installed at the Japanese American National Museum. Brandon lives in the desert. Brandon, thank you so much for being here. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, it's all right for folks to leave questions for you in the, in the chat and, and you'll have some time to answer them after your reading. Sure. And 
nobody should feel any pressure to ask me questions. <laughs> so good. But you're, you're welcome to. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Brandon. I will leave you to it. Okay. Thank you so much, Aaron, and thank you, Courtney, and thank you, Kurt. Um, building off of what he just shared, I think I'm, what I'm going to share is a little piece of my own fermented love. Thanks to Kurt for that. So I'm going to read a short version of an essay that is titled 49 Stones for the Poetry of Japanese American Incarceration. Uh, it's a short version, so I'm only going to read 25 of these stones. Originally titled 49 Stones, which was corresponding with the 49 days of mourning that follows a person's death in Buddhist tradition. So 25 stones for the poetry of Japanese American incarceration. One, we yearn to hear each other, find each other to make our sounds so heard that even the dead will hear us speak. Heather Nagami, The Gift. Two, after their first winter in prison and after the snow melted, the Japanese prisoners, Issei men in their 50s and 60s, noticed all over the prison grounds stones, stones of infinite color, shape, and design thrust up through the dirt. Perhaps this is the site of an ancient river or sea, wrote Iwao Matsushita, one of the pr prisoners, in a letter to his wife, Hanaye. For polished pebbles are strewn all over, and everyone is immersed in collecting these stones, adding, like children, March 9th, 1942. Iwao was incarcerated in the Department of Justice prison in Missoula, Montana. His wife, Hanaye, received a letter at home in Seattle. Iwa was, in the hours after the attack on Pearl Harbor, apprehended by the FBI, then turned over to INS. He arrived in Missoula December 28th. The valley that Sunday was covered in snow. In the spring, the stones grew like flowers. Iwa was one of the men who kept busy by gathering stones. The men polished the stones, made jewelry, sculptures, gifts for their families. Iwa mailed stones to Hanae. So avid is this stone picking, Iwao wrote, that it is said that anyone not involved in this hobby is not human. Gathering of stones was, way to, was a way to be and stay in the midst of being criminalized as enemy aliens of the country to which they had immigrated, to which they had committed their families and their futures, human. And also, as Iwao wrote, children. Three. The poets of Japanese American incarceration, especially the Sansei, Yonsei, Gosei descendants of the camps, including Heather Nagami, Brian Komei Dempster, Bryn Saito, Christine Kitano, W. Todd Kaneko, Mia Ayumi Mahatra, are not only the inheritors of the history, more specifically of their ancestors' experiences, but are the reanimation of the prisoners who kept busy by gathering stones polishing and making out of them works of art. They are the reanimation of the prisoners' movements, curiosity, enthusiasm, ingenuity, boredom, and despair. It is not that the poets are in need, as the prisoners might have been, of keeping busy, but that there is a reflexive, perhaps ancestral need to return to the ruins of incarceration and gather from them the fragments of what might generate a meaning that has been withheld, even disappeared. Poetry is a way for the descendants to be and stay in the midst of having been delivered into the realization of their ancestors' dreams and desires of the future as citizens, human. Four, when a descendant returns to and confronts an event, an experience that their family members endured and likely are enduring still, what questions do they ask? What is the first question that comes to mind? Which is another way of asking, where does one begin? Five, what are the differences between memory and history? One gives birth to fire and one gives birth to stones. Bryn Saito, 13 ways of looking at a teacher resource. Seven, one of the few things that can with any certainty 
that one can with any certainty expect to find in the ruins of Japanese American incarceration, in the physical ruins of the innumerable incarceration sites are stones. 10, if I can find it, how much can I really know? Asks Brian Comey Dempster in his poem, Crossing, in which he visits the ruins of Topaz, where his mother and grandparents were incarcerated. The further Dempster drives into the desert, the more his thoughts and his vision become hallucinatory. I half dream in waves of heat, summon ghosts from the canyon beyond thin lines of barbed wire, as if Dempster's velocity through the desert toward his family's fragmented history offers an occasion for the fragments of his family's history to begin, however haltingly, to congregate. 11. What does a poet do? Poetry. But what is poetry? Poetry is a perpetual because irresolvable return to the ruins, the ruins of history and of memory, out of which might be harvested flashes of consciousness that are converted through language into literature. 12. The second section of Bryn Saito's book, Power Made Us Swoon, includes the following poems. Stone in the Desert Camp, 1942. Stone Chorus, Manzanar. Stone on Watch at Dawn. Stone Returns 70 Years Later and Lifting the Stone, the last of which ends... I go on blindly, seeking a life with life at the center, seeking a life with clarity sharp as a saint's knife at the center. Split the wood, said the prophet in the lost gospel. Lift the stone, there I'll be found. Blindly is how it feels. Blindly is how it must feel to seek a life, any life. But to seek a life with life at the center is sightedness. Sightedness does not relieve us from the complexities, the seeming improbabilities of seeking what manifests in the process of seeking. Sightedness becomes synesthetic, extrasensory, and what becomes extrasensory becomes overwhelming, makes the seeking feel as if in a fog. I'm on the brink of becoming unrecognizable to myself, Bryn Saito writes. 14. Saito's poem, Stone in the Desert Camp, 1942, begins. Between the turtle rock and the crane rock, the children found me. I was shining and smooth and silent about my secrets. A stone is speaking. What follows is a poem in which a stone narrates in 24 lines the life of an, of an American concentration camp. From the construction of the barracks to the emergence in the barracks of voices singing, even dancing. But mostly what caught me was the quiet, concentrated chatter of elders, the stone relates. The stone is omnipotent. The stone is an ear of penetrating sympathy. But why is the stone silent about its secrets? Are the secrets what the stone narrates? Or are the secrets deeper, less expressible, more private? 15. But what we don't anticipate is how the dust of the desert will clot our throats, how much fear will conspire to keep us silent, and how our children will read this silence as shame. Christine Catano Gaman. 16. The secrets of the experience of incarceration of the camps are activated by the appearance and especially the curiosity of children. Children waste no time in homing in on the subject, the space of great puzzlement and mystery. They are preternaturally adept at divining the source of silence. Children ask questions with their eyes and with their hands. Children do not need to be told to lift the stone. Children simply lift the stone. Like children, Iwao Matsushita wrote. 17. But what are the stone's secrets? What is the stone withholding? What has not yet been spoken or shared or revealed about Japanese American incarceration? Against the electric blue and purple and green aura of the stone's secrets are set the questions that have existed within the community and within each family for generations. 
the most aching questions being the least expressible for not knowing where exactly to begin or how, but wanting to desperately. 18, which is another way of asking, where did one begin? 21, we were gemstones strewn in the wasteland, Brian Comey Dempster crossing. 25, the meaning of an experience may or may not be realized in the time it first occurred or is occurring, but may require one or several generations in order to process itself or be processed by someone else or a community outside of itself, which may require in turn a process of deep inquiry, research, reenactment, enchantment, a kind of haunting in reverse. Poetry is a method of translating an unrealized experience into an interactive panorama. 27. One way that the Japanese Americans transfigured their barracks into momentarily endurable and sustainable homes was by designing and making gardens, thousands of gardens, thousands of dreams realized as pathological responses to a loss of control, thousands of effigies to the state expedited evolution of Japanese American life. The gardens appeared almost immediately, vegetable gardens, cactus gardens, flower gardens, victory gardens, stone gardens, almost immediately as if the gardens were transplanted from home, as if they were abstract spaces into which the Japanese could enter to temper the sense of alienation they felt upon arrival. 28, in camp, it said, they cut gardens into Arkansas desert, fixed rocks into the flat face of the earth and irrigated bean rows to feed their families. Healthy vines appeared where none should have grown. Tiny buds coaxed from the earth, tendrils that spooled runners through dust. Mia Ayumi Mahatra, Portrait of Isako in Wartime. 29. What is as true for the poet as it was for the prisoner is that if the right stones are not available, they must be invented. The Japanese Americans relocated stones from elsewhere for example, from the Inyo Mountains outside Manzanar for use in the construction of their gardens. 30, a stone is not a weapon, like a name is not a stone, yet it's hard to see what a man builds with the stones he has chosen. W. Todd Kaneko, Land of the Free. 35, to lift the stone is not only to touch the stone, but produce for the stone the vault of secrets about which it chooses to either speak or stay silent, its shadow. 41, the work of a poet of Japanese American incarceration, especially a descendant who was not there, is the work of pilgrimage. Life for a descendant is pilgrimage. Life is a pilgrimage to the past, to the stories, to the stories that were told, to the stories that were not told, to one's ancestors, to the ruins. The pilgrimage is repetitive, seems futile, and often does not because it cannot ever end. 46, in Bryn Saito's Stone Returns 70 years later, a stone narrates the movements of a writer, a woman in the ruins of Manzanar. The stone is in the writer's left pocket, but the stone can feel and can see and can sense everything. The stone wonders if the writer will ever stop moving, will ever just be still. How to ask her to be so still, the desert flowers coalesce around her like sky's chorus at dawn. She can't. She paces the length of the barrack blocks. The writer pacing rubs the stone in her pocket like a rosary. The stone narrates, the stone permits a feeling and admission of its own. I'm worn, I'm tired of their histories. 48, the filmmaker Ria Tajiri, who has made my two favorite films about Japanese American incarceration, History and Memory and Strawberry Fields, and who is also by, a way, by the way, a devoted collector of stones, told me a story about how she was once asked by a friend 
aren't you tired of being an internment artist? When she told me this, I laughed. Then I grimaced. I felt the underlying truth. Such a question might shame a person into re-examining their obsessions and the reasons why they are unable to exercise them. It is not a question though, but a reduction and an insult. I wanted to answer on behalf of Tajiri and myself and say, I am tired, yes, but I have only begun. 49, because it is okay to be tired, because it is okay to be worn. To be worn is to have covered and protected a body. To be tired is to have been chosen, to have been given a life. One, we yearn to hear each other, find each other, to make our sounds so heard that even the dead will hear us speak. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Brandon. That was beautiful. I am now excited to introduce to you these next two videos, which are coming from Miki Orihara. Uh, she is best known for her work as a principal dancer in the Martha Graham Dance Company, which she joined in 1987. And in addition to performing the Graham repertory, she has worked closely with renowned Japanese American dancer, choreographer and director Yuriko, preserving her unique approach to Graham technique. Um, Orihara presented Resonance 2 in New York City in April 2017, and she danced works by Mars Cunningham, Lara Lubovitch, uh, Charlotte Griffin, Martha Graham, and a collaboration with Tanro Ishida and Resonance 3, was in May of 2019, where she danced works by Martha Graham, Doris Humphrey, Seiko Takata, Konami Ishii, and Yuriko. So we are very grateful to have the opportunity to share two of these works with you today, Moon Dance by Konami Ishii, and then Martha Graham's Lamentation. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Adele Arakawa, former news anchor at KUSA and a proud member of the Asian American community. Every 10 years, the United States counts everyone living in this country as of April 1st, regardless of their citizenship status. The census makes sure that resources are properly allocated to all our communities. Census data helps the U.S. government distribute more than $675 billion per year to resources like schools, roads, hospitals, and programs like Medicare and Medicaid, low-income housing, and much, much more. There is no citizenship question on the 2020 census. Your responses are confidential and protected by law. Personal information is never shared with any other government agencies or law enforcement. It is important. Do it for you and your community. Start here at 2020census.gov. Hey, Courtney. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you again to uh, Miki Orihara. Um, and then thank you for that. That last PSA um, from Adele Arakawa was arranged by um, Joey Ha, who's a partnership specialist in the US Census Bureau, um, coordinating that message, which felt really appropriate this week since our, <laughs> our theme is what is citizenship, right? Is that the theme? Yes. Um, <laughs> so, so anyway, um, so thank you, Joy Ha, for that. Um, and now we are moving into our feature performers. Uh, we're so um, honored to have Ho Atsu Taiko here with us. Um, Ho Atsu Taiko is a collective of musicians based in Chicago, Illinois, and they take a fresh take on the art of Japanese drumming, which is Taiko. They blend the deep rooted culture of Japanese American Taiko with influences that inspire and celebrate the diversity of their performing members. And their mission is to spread joy through each and every drum beat by creating music that is true to who they are. Um, today, we're going to be joined by Jason, who you guys may recognize from um, our film festival. And, um, and we're also here, joined here today by Emily and Dana. So please help us, well, <laughs> help us welcome. <laughs> Oh, Taiko. <laughs> Hi, welcome. Oh, we're missing Jason. <laughs> Come back. <laughs> I can fill in as Jason. Oh, there he is. <laughs> I was already Jason. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. All we'll right. let you guys go from here. Awesome. Thank you so much for having us today. Um, if you want to just jump in to start. So what we're going to do is, um, I know this is dubbed as a performance, 
and uh, we're doing our best to try to bring you some live Taiko, which we're going to get to. But um, in in this 2020 year of adjusting everything to a virtual setting, we thought it would be really interesting, um, <clears throat> maybe to provide you know kind of a background and like behind the scenes look into um, a show that we had developed that we were supposed to tour this entire year that we were super excited about. Um, in a lot of ways, it was um, uh, like a really pinnacle moment for us in terms of like bringing kind of the values of the individual members of our group um, into kind of this intersecting point with the art that we were creating. And we had a whole plan to present this um, on a tour this year. Um, so yeah, I think it will be fun to kind of go through with, with all of you. So uh, that's the plan today. We're going to talk a little bit about, you know, some, some like, um, I would, I would call them organizational philosophies. We'll talk a little bit about um, what we're doing internally and how we develop the art. And then uh, we'll also show a few clips from, from um, uh, the performance. So I'm gonna hand it off to Emily. She's gonna get us started. And um, yeah, enjoy. Okay, and we can go to the next slide now. And so, just like it says, I want everybody to right now stand up. I want you to bring your hands with your palms up. Yeah. And I want you to breathe with me. Ready? Breathe in. Two, three, four. Breathe out. Two, three, four. Breathe in. Two, three, four. Breathe out. Two, three, four. Breathe in. Two, three, four, and out, two, three, last one, breathe in, two, three, four, breathe out, two, three, four. So today we have Dana Johnson, Jason Matsumoto, myself, mm -hmm. Emily Harada. We are going to be your presenters today. We're all members of Hoatsu Taiko. You can do the next slide now. All right, so I'm gonna kick us off, um, give you all a quick introduction to who we are and um, what we're all about. So Hawatsu, we are based in Chicago. We, um, as, a, as an ensemble, we've been around for about 21 years, um, actually 22 years. And um, we have a lineage to um, our parent group at the Midwest Buddhist Temple, uh, Midwest Buddhist Temple Taiko. Um, and that kind of like in the history of um, kind of like the, the development of Taiko, um, very early on, the, the Buddhist temples across the country were um, very significant in allowing to create this network where Taiko could spread. And so our parent group, the Midwest Buddhist Temple, they actually were first taught by uh, some folks in LA, um, I'm sure some people on the phone will know this um, temple and group. It's called Kinara, Kinara Taiko um, from Los Angeles. And um, so there's this kind of direct lineage to the, the what I would call like more of like the, the center of where Taiko originated in the US. Um, and it was through these different, the, these different temples like uh, Denver, um, Chicago, uh, so Daiko in New York that I think really created a foundation for Taiko. So we're really, you know, proud and, and, and um, you know, we still practice at, at the Midwest Buddhist temple and that's where we hold, hold all of our drums. It, it's, it's quite a special relationship. Uh, many of the members, um, kind of the legacy members of Hoatsu came from um, the temple. And, you know, I think I would say maybe 10, 12 years ago, we, we realized that like, our membership was based on temple membership, and we realized that you know we, we would need to um, expand and build a little bit because um, if you are part of temple communities, you'll know that there was like a lot of shrinking in, in like the the number of kids and people who were involved in um, the BCA, the Buddhist Churches of America. So about 12 years ago, 12, 13 years ago, we decided to open our membership up, and um, that really I think set the stage for like a a very different um, development moment for the group. And um, 
we started uh, attracting people that had like a really strong background in music, people that had a really strong background in performing arts. And um, over the past 10, 12 years, it's really been about, um, you know, like I think finding our voice as uh, artists and musicians and, 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 and really challenging ourselves to think about what the legacy and the history of the kind of the Japanese-ness of what makes Taiko Taiko and then um, the influence of these like really strong Japanese American groups uh, that helped to develop and I would say in a way like very much globalized Taiko. Um, thinking about all these different origination points and um, kind of honing in on like what our sound is, what our values are, who we are, and what kind of music we can create, right? Kind of respecting the traditions and adhering to um, like, you know, honoring kind of this deep musical tradition of taiko that 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 has an unbelievably rich and deep history um what can we contribute you know as as a group in 2019 or 2020. um so yeah so that is a quick introduction to who we are uh if you want to learn more you can always head up to our website um emily does a lot of our social media posting so um you can always follow us i think we're funny yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, yeah, we are. Uh, our general you'll, you'll, see, you'll see it the, um, towards the end of the presentation. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, so uh, jumping in to, uh, we can move on to slide four now. So I think to really try to explain Emergent, the show that came out um, in 2019, and it was supposed to be debuted in 2020, we're gonna go back a little bit and learn about what's Emergent strategy. So emergent strategy is an alternative to the traditional hierarchical structure of groups. And in this structure, each person's voice holds equal power. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Adrian Brown introduced this concept to the mainstream in her 2017 book, Emergent Strategies. Brown was greatly inspired by the science fiction works of Octavia Butler, um, a premier uh, African-American uh, science fiction novelist and the worlds and societies that Butler created. Brown watched Grace Lee Boggs, a prominent Asian American activist, harness the power of emergent strategy as a base for her activism in Detroit from 1950s until her death in 2015. Emergent strategy can be seen in nature. Fungus structures grow underground and put up mushrooms without a plan. The organisms involve just to communicate and work together to find the best directions to stretch. Or think of a flock of birds who has no one clear leader. Each bird in the flock is attuned to the one next to it, and as a single body, they move through the air. Next slide, please. Hoetsu adopted the practice of emergent strategy because we felt that it was more than just a way to be an organization, to have this flat hierarchical structure. We strongly believe that practicing the principles of emergent strategy within our own group, we could uh, better influence the larger communities in a positive way. And this is actually starkly different than a lot of other Taiko groups and um, other organizations that follow a very hierarchical traditional dojo style of organization. But by moving to this flatter uh, organizational structure where each person's voice has equal power, um, we have found that it's actually allowed all of us to bring our ideas to the table and strengths. And it actually has made our group even stronger. I've been a member of OSU for 10 years and over that time, our group has only just gotten better and better. And as a result of moving to a system where we are all able to collaborate and come to this decision-making together, uh, we have only gotten better. Um, and this show, uh, Emergent, is um, just an example of that. Next slide. Yeah, thanks, Dana. So I think, um maybe you didn't expect to come onto this presentation and have like a five slides about what emergent strategy is, but I think it's, 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 it's really foundational to the way that we've been thinking in the past two or three years about um, how we can elevate what we do and how we can make the, the individuals who are part of that process proud of that process and really understand and see their voices in that process. And it really changes the way that we run everything from how we manage ourselves, how the music and the art is created, how the decisions about large projects get done. So I just wanted to, to go through a few of the core principles. Um, uh, we're also, you know, 
we're not getting paid to do this, but if you buy this book and you read about it and you think about like these principles, um, I, I think in many ways, oh, one point that I wanted to make on an earlier slide, the three women, or sorry, the three people that Dana mentioned are all women. And I think that's very important because it's, 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 a, it's, it's a significantly different organizational structure than I think like a, you know, corporate or like, um, or like a capital, what, what capitalism generally tends to um, uh, value. So some of these core principles, small is good, change is constant, change is the only thing that's guaranteed. Um, there is always enough time for the right work. Just imagine being in meetings where there's like a, a minute by minute agenda and you're skipping some important conversations for the sake of hitting agenda items, right? Um, these people in this moment, right? So that means like really understanding who you're surrounded by and who you're with and thinking about um, what makes that team of people and this moment very special. And then um, the last one out here is never a failure, always a lesson. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the ways that these processes actually uh, become um, <clears throat> enacted upon or you know, kind of come to life. Um, this first, these first two I really love, right? So it's, it's if you trust the people, they become trustworthy. And I think a lot of us that run teams and think about like, you know, organizations and helping different people and, and building community in, in particular. Um, it, this, is, this is an easy thing to hear, but a hard thing to, to actually practice. Like giving people trust, they become trustworthy. I, I just really like that cadence. Um, moving at the speed of trust. So again, this comes back to like, um, is, it, is it worth hitting agenda items or is it worth taking the time to have the conversations that you need to have? And then, um, Less prep, more presence. Uh, Emily and Dana will like this one because even in the way that we put this presentation together, um, there was less press prep, and I was asking them to be more present. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, finally, um, what you pay attention to grows. So I think that is really related to presence. So these are all the things that I know we're going through this very quickly, but just wanted to give you some ideas around like both. Uh, the principles and the process that emerging strategy asks us to, to consider. Next slide, please. So from actually learning all about this emerging strategy and bringing it into our group, the first thing we did is we worked with a facilitator from Luma and she came in and helped us use problem tree analysis to figure out how we can grow more as a group. And so one thing that we had to sit down and think about is how we practice and like what makes, what, when we come to practice every week, twice a week, like, why are we there? What do we bring? How can we bring more and like push ourselves more? And we explored like over the course of two 90 minute sessions, just how to better formulate a practice strategy and allowing everybody's voices to come together and talk through this, like all 10 of us at the time. Um, one of the things that actually came out of that was the idea of one of the things that really helps us focus at practice is actually having a really amazing end goal. So uh, in this, so uh, from that, we decided to actually start coming up with the concert vision of Emergent. And that was something we developed over the course of uh, 2019. Uh, next slide. So we used 2019 to test out how to incorporate Emergent strategy uh, in the three sections that are listed, the art, our values, and staging and stage presence. And throughout this year, we were asking ourselves, what is our narrative journey and what should people do, uh, be prepared to do? We got to incorporate emergent strategy into performances in very different locations and settings that would then help us form our 2020 stage show, Emergent. Next slide. Cool, so I'll talk about um, the art side of it, I think. Um, the artistic journey that we, <laughs> I tried to make it really clear and simple. Uh, I think over the, I, this probably has taken years, right? Three, four, five, five years, and we're, we're very much still on this journey, right? But at least in my head, the way I'd been thinking about it and the way that we were talking about it as a group was just really about how do we move 
from an existence where the things were the music that we're playing and the values currently maybe do not intersect perfectly well or like um, aren't aren't thought through in that way. How do we move from that situation into into a situation where our art and our values do intersect? And we have been feeling like that is a really strong way to think about um, what it means for us to perform for people, um, the conversations that we can have after shows. And you know, really just thinking about like this this intersection between values and art. Um, it's been, I would say, um, so much of our kind of journey up until maybe three or four years ago was to uh, call on some of the best and brightest players of um, and like practitioners of Taiko, and bring them to Chicago, um, work with them, collaborate with them, and be inspired by. Um, them, right? So, like, it, it was very, it was a very externally focused type of inspiration where we were reaching out to groups around the world, asking them to come teach us. And I think um, through the process that Dana just described of thinking about what what we would do in in uh, 2020, like a big project, and landing on this, like, we need to self produce our own 90 minute show, right? Like, just the act of of, of doing that and stating that and agreeing on that goal as an, as an entire group allowed us to, to start thinking about the art um, kind of along this path of we are currently in the section where we do not intersect, how do we move to where we do intersect? So that was a big, that was a big challenge to, our, to, to everybody in the group um, in preparation for the show. Next slide, please. Okay. And so um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about how we were able to apply our indiv individual members and collectively Hoatsu's values and truths into the show so that we can project it onto our audience. Um, and so in the beginning of all this, we started with breathing. We'll go over that a little bit later. But the main other things that we were trying to focus on was this collective humility and power that we have. Um, something else that's very unique about Hoatsu is that if you look at us, um, we're not an ensemble that's majority Japanese American or Japanese period. And in fact, a lot of us don't know Japanese. I think maybe about one or two of us do. Um, so in our own pieces, we use English and Japanese lyrics to narrate the stories um, that we're trying to convey. And so even for today, um, we're going to be showing two different pieces where we just use English lyrics. Uh, that's going to be for Poston, Night What is Another One, and Emergent. Hopefully one day you can see these in person. Um, and kind of like what Jason had said already, we perform original music that feels authentic to our diverse experiences. So it's not just one composer that we have. It's, um, I guess, even for this show, I think we had about like four or five of us composing different pieces, as well as collaborating and getting other members' insights on it too. Um, other values that we had that weren't as obvious in this show, but are still just as important, is equity. If you were to look at our statement, you could see that um, more in depth. And it's a, one of the examples of how we were trying to use equity with our show is that we were bringing this performance to audiences that normally don't have access to Taiko, um, in 2019 specifically, we got to play on the front porch of a wooden cabin, like this really small one, in a park in Berea, Kentucky. And I don't know if many of you have heard of Berea before. I hadn't. Um, I think it's south of Lexington. And this is actually home to the first interracial and co-educational college in the south. And this uh, specific town, it's very small, but they continue to bring all these different musicians from kind of all over in terms of cultural um, cultural background. And they had this music festival and we got to be part of that. And so we were helping bring this larger musical collection to Berea. Um, now we also were able to perform in other smaller towns throughout Illinois, mostly in central Illinois. They're all over three hours away from Chicago that may not have seen Tycho otherwise. And, in 2020, we we're also planning to continue that, um, but unfortunately that was a little bit halted. Okay, you can go to the next st slide, please. Can I just add one thing, Emily? So sure. I think when Emily was talking about the Berea, Kentucky show, um, that, that in my mind was like 
a really important moment because so this this series that happens in Berea, Kentucky, um, the stated goal of the of the series is to bring to bring uh, basically to introduce diversity and di diversity of opinion, diversity of music, diversity of sound people <clears throat> to this small town in Berea, Kentucky, and really like when you speak to the organizers of this, it, it's really about, you know, combating um, things like racism and systemic racism. And they're doing it in a way by bringing um, people from all across the country from very different backgrounds into this one space to, to, to kind of um, pr present their music. And I think it was, it was really, for me, it was that show that kind of made me really think about uh, the act of being a Taiko group. Oftentimes we're asked to travel to very small towns and very like remote places in the Midwest and perform. <clears throat> and as I was thinking about like that act of like having the access to go into a place, right? What what is our responsibility <clears throat> to talk about our values? And that's kind of where this this like value to art alignment thing started getting really strong. So I just wanted to make that point before we move on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even just after um, at that specific performance too, it wasn't just the the people that were running it. It was also just the audience, and we had the ability to actually talk to talk to some of the um, audience members like a longer state as opposed to just that like I don't know two five minute window of just no that didn't carry as much depth. And so I think that did really influence um, not just Jason, but I think the entire group too. That was definitely one of the more terrible performances that we've had. Um, so I'm also going to talk about uh, staging and stage plots. And we were looking for this one, how do we develop internal decision-making processes that center around emergent strategy? So for this one, our approach was we had the skeleton that went according to initial plans on song orders and transitions. Um, and I'm realizing now for those that don't play Taiko that are watching this or that don't necessarily um, do stage performances, this might kind of be a lot, but uh, just to kind of break it down um, in between each pieces, we also look at how do we connect one piece to another piece? And usually we have like maybe one artistic director or one person that just kind of, you know, cuts it all out. And that's how we were doing it in the past too. Uh, but for this style, though, or for this emergent strategy, uh, we were able to transform this and use ideas from these different members from different performances. And so we would even break into different com committees and use a dynamic process of figuring, figuring out how we can actually move our instruments and how we can actually carry ourselves to match the mood of a particular piece uh, or the overarching theme of the show line. We would also focus on stage presence uh, where we're not just playing on drums, right? Um, it's an entire stage so, show. So we're looking at how do we walk on and off of the stage? How are we picking up our bachi or our sticks? How do we stand in front of the drum? It's all part of the show, right? So um, one other small example of putting this all into consideration is we would actually bleed some of our pieces together. So we would make the start and the end of a piece kind of combined so you can't tell when it, where the clear cut is to indicate that us as an ensemble are all just arriving together to present something new. And so it's like this, um, this concept, right? Of moving on and off stage, it's all very important. And we were able to apply emergent strategy even to the point where we're off the stage and we're breathing, we're leading some breathing and the people that are off stage are still breathing together. Okay. You can go to the next uh, slide, please. Okay, so this is gonna get into um, kind of the construction of the specific show. Um, and um, <laughs> I was thinking about this presentation and it's, 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 it's quite appropriate because the way that we thought about, um, you know, we were thinking about like, what, what is the goal of the show? You know, again, like how do you, how do you um, intersect art and value kind of in this interesting way through Tycho specifically. And um, we had been kicking around these different structures of how we would think about the narrative arc of the performance and the music and the, and as Emily was mentioning, the movement. 
And um, we were thinking about this, this, this idea of a journey. And, um, and then somebody in our group, Tiana, she came, um, she, she came back with this. She'd been reading about pilgrimage theory, which is a theory that you can read about. Um, and she brought this to us as a potential framework. And so we started looking at it and it, it really made a lot of sense. Um, I actually, um, we, are, we are obviously celebrating this, this virtual pilgrimage for almost nine weeks straight as, a, um, as uh, something to do in place of, you know, meeting in person during um, the, summer, the summer of uh, pilgrimage typic, uh, to, that typically take place. And it's, it's this interesting thing where I think um, it was probably in some ways um, inspired by like some of the group members actually going to these Japanese American pilgrimages and understanding kind of seeing, seeing the transformations that were taking, pla taking place. And then we kind of bolstered that with um, like some academic I ideas of, of like the, the arc of a pilgrimage. And that became like the backbone and foundation of the show. So I just want to walk you through like, um, very quickly how we how we did that uh so you'll see a bunch of names um if you go to the next slide so there's martin and nigel palmer victor and edith turner these are all people that have written about um uh maybe academically about pilgrimages and many of the research around pilgrimages you know they they basically break things up into many different stages um Martin and Nigel braced up into seven, sorry, nine different stages of like kind of transformation. Um, the Turners break it up into four different sections. And so as we were looking at this, the idea really is, is like what we tried to like um, distill this down to is that there's really three kind of acts or three moments of um, a, a pilgrim's journey. It's when you come by yourself to form the group right? There's the formation period when you're together with new people and you are kind of feeling people out, understanding what the group means, understanding why you're there, uh, sharing information, um, building coalition, building community, right? And then uh, three is a made up word. It's, we made up a word called, that just said sound swell. And in, in, in uh, more traditional pilgrimage theory, this is the moment when like the group coalesces around something and becomes something much bigger and more powerful than any individual. So that, that, that was kind of the narrative arc that we um, applied to the show. And if you click the slide to the next slide, I will <laughs> try to explain this. So this is my visual representation. Um, you have one individual in the formation section that brings skills, experiences, and values, right? During the liminality section, um, that's when a, a, a bunch of people are bringing a bunch of different skills and experiences and values together. And it's still kind of like, you know, like a, it's liminal, it's, it's the liminal space, right? And then um, sound swell is kind of when they, I call it the optimist prime moment, like when the, the transformers all form into the big one and then like they're aligned and they're, they're now able to see kind of like what they can accomplish together. So that's just a quick visual for like the way that we were thinking of the narrative arc of the show. Next slide, please. Dana, you're on mute. Sorry. Uh, so um, as Jason noted, uh, coming from this pilgrimage theory, uh, when we put the actual show together, we made it three separate story arcs of uh, formation, which is everyone arriving as an individual, the liminality of this transitional period, and then the sound swell, which is um, the building of community. It's also loud. Um, another better summary that we all talked about was just the idea of arriving, growing, uniting, and thriving. Um, and that that was what the show was supposed to represent. And that's what we wanted to, uh, that's the story we wanted to tell. Um, can you go to the next slide? Uh, the, this is actually the set list from the very first time we played through um, the immersion um, idea. Um, it was in Notre Dame, uh, University of Notre Dame in um, Indiana. Um, and it was in January of 2020. 
and this was the set list. And so what we did is we sat down, looked at the pieces we had that we've already created, the pieces that we were writing, and then we tried to see where pieces would fit, what to us meant formation, what to us meant liminality, what to us meant sound swell. And actually, I think it ended up being a lot easier than originally thought to actually take what we had already written, what we'd already created, and actually make this show and make this storyline. And then, um, as Emily said, then sometimes what we had to do was for transitional purposes between pieces, like find ways to move from one song to the other in a very seamless and beautiful like manner. And so that's why you would have sometimes the Breathe Collective, which Emily kind of actually gave you a slight taste of what that looked like um, at the beginning of this presentation. Um, or there was a vocal theme that actually kind of carried throughout the entire, uh, that carried throughout the show that we tried to bring back again and again, um, that really, I think, uh, hit on the story we were trying to tell. And also um, the nice thing about this structure is um, over time, over this current year, we were actually also thinking of writing new pieces that we were gonna be able to um, try to put into the show somehow. Uh, so if we found songs that we felt were a better representation of what liminality might do, we were gonna be able to be very malleable with our set list. Um, this was the set list that we did in January, and this was the set list we were also going to be presenting in Schaumburg, Illinois in March. Next slide. Sorry, is that me? Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so, so, um, this one's hard for me to talk about because we were really like, one way that we were thinking about um, connecting each of the different sections. And I think it, in a big way, um, we were asking ourselves, you know, like when you go to a show, right? Like when you go to watch a performance, how often do you feel connected as audience members, right? Like you might feel some connection to the people who are playing, but the question to ourselves was like, how, if, if, if the goal is like art and value intersection, how do you actually connect through a performance where you're separated from the audience, right? And we thought that, you know, breathing is, is an incredibly universal thing, right? We all, it, it, it's something that connects us as humans, right? We, and, and even beyond like, you know, humans, this is, this connects us, right, breathing. Right, and so um, if you recall from the last slide, there's there's three underlying sections that was called the, the breath collective, and um, it was simply just sending three people onto the stage and doing that exercise that we all did together at the top of the stage. So if you imagine a completely dark space, a completely dark house and it's completely silent, and the only thing that's happening are three people breathing in the state. We use that theme of like breathing and, and how, how breath is a connection across all of us to pull that through the entire um, story arc of the show. And um, it was like, we tried this in Notre Dame, like we got to play this show one time this year, and it was really incredible because, because by the end of the show, uh, we actually end the show with breathing. So like it kind of comes down into this really calm and like serene space. Um, by the end of the show, we didn't even need to tell people to breathe, but like the entire audience, there's this pulsating happening that's that like when they're breathing with us, right? And um, in our minds, that was like a really interesting moment because it, you felt so connected to the people that you couldn't even see, you know, in the audience um, because we were taking the exact same breath, right? So we, for, fast forward, um, you know, into coronavirus, and this is like very clearly a thing that we'll need to remove from any in-person show that we're gonna do. So it was, and it was, that for me was hard to think about because so much of like the, the centerpiece of the show was about this like breath and like the collective breath. Um, and I just imagine it's gonna be hard to um, require an entire, you know, like, um, audience to breathe very deeply right next to each other as we come out of coronavirus. 
And then I, you know, like as I was putting this this presentation together, it it, it also made me realize like, um, it breathing connects all humans, but um, breathing is also a right that not everybody has, and we've seen that through um, the George Floyd case, through you know many other Black Americans who have like been on videotape talking about how they can't breathe, and so it's just it's just been this really interesting thought process now that we are kind of in a very different moment in the country and um, th the context around breath um, has shifted. So I have nothing, I have no great conclusions. I don't know if Dana or, or, or Emily have any great conclusions, but this is all real time and it's like very much happening in all of our heads about if we were to do the show again, what would we need to change? Uh, like this idea around breath and like these these kind of new ideas that, that are coming up around breath, like how do we think about those? Um, so, but I would encourage everybody to take deep breaths uh, in your own houses because that, that is a that's a great way to you know de-stress. I, I will interject that I remember in the March 2020, everything is getting really crazy, and the question starts to come up like, are we going to be able to do this show at the end of March? And we're all like, well, no, I think it should probably be okay. And then we actually have a person in our group who is a PhD candidate in biology and virology. And she's like, you guys are asking people to take deep breaths with us on stage. And we all stopped and we're like, oh, yeah, okay. Now this actually kind of put us all in this other framework of like, can we do this show the way we would want to be able to do this show when we started to calculate if it made sense to go ahead and pull the trigger on our uh, uh, end of uh, March show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On a on another note, with that, Jason, I'm looking at our notes on this slide, and I do see that the last thing that's there is preparing for action, and that you do need to be able to breathe and to give yourself a breath, especially during this time right now, where there, we all have a lot of stress and anxiety. There's so much going on right now; it's unprecedented. But we also still need to prepare for action and keep breathing. And that's a message I think we also need to remember too. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Emily. Mm -hmm. Think I think we can go to the next slide now. Okay, and so with that, we will be showing um, two pieces today from our show Emergent. And I'm going to talk about the first one, which is called Postin. Of course, for uh, a virtual pilgrimage, we need to talk about this piece. Um, and so you would think that this piece, which is about you know an incarceration camp, it's titled Poston, uh, we would be reflecting on a person that would be in a liminal space. Uh, but the reason why we have it, we actually put it in the formation uh, section. Um, and the reason why is that it follows that journey of a narrator where you've arrived and you're searching for something and you're preoccupied with your own internal landscapes. Like there's like some sort of high potential energy. And it's right before the threshold of uh, diving into the liminal space. So that's why we ended up putting it in that section instead. Um, now a little bit more about this piece. So I actually wrote this one in 2016 following Trump's election. And this was as a reflection piece about my grandfather, Masaru Harada, who was incarcerated at post -in war relocation camp. And uh, it is the common story where he never really spoke much about the camps or his experience to anyone, including with his family. And so with the stories from my grandmother, June, and the musical help of my mom, so this is kind of an intergenerational piece, uh, we were able to, and, and I also did incorporate some of the conversations I just had with the Chicago Japanese American community I found these two different voices um, from these conversations. And I wanted to highlight these two different voices with the use of Tycho. And so when you're watching this, in the back, there's gonna be two different rows. And in the back row, that's supposed to represent this rigid shikata kanai, or like compliancy for a survival voice. And it's supposed to be resembled by this sharp staccato rhythm. While you have in the front row, this is an oppositional, non-traditional, offbeat pattern and a lot more physical movement to represent this pent-up emotion in response to the unjust incarceration and their alienation they are experiencing. Um, 
Now, the ending of the piece returns back to present day uh, through a song with English lyrics that asks the audience, where do we go from here? What lies ahead? And it also has this message that we cannot let this happen again. And unfortunately, when I was kind of writing what I wanted to say about it, this is a moment that I've realized where I want to change that ending because it is happening again. And it has been happening again to the black and brown communities. And this story has been coming forward more and more. And so um, we'll see where this piece takes us, but things are always changing, right? Uh, the only thing constant is change. So this was the latest uh, video take on Postin. You can go ahead and play the video now.
<laughs> Thanks, Emily, for walking us through that. We have one more um, slide for all of you. Yep. Uh, sorry, one more video for all of you. Yeah. Um, so so um, actually, in so we were supposed to have a show in Schaumburg, Illinois, at the end of March, and unfortunately, it was canceled. Um, and we were, we're at this time, we we're actually unable still to go back to our practice space to uh, practice Tycho. Um, but uh, over the last four months, we've actually stayed very connected. Um, and uh, we have Zoom practices twice a week. And one of the things, the ideas that came out of these Zoom practices was to stay connected to each other and to the show. And these ideas that had come up is that we um, put together a video that of the final piece of the show, Emergent, written by uh, Jason Matsumoto and Annabelle Hirano. Um, it's the title song. And uh, we actually would like, it, I kinda, it's kind of always weird doing this after Posted because Posted is so beautiful and serious. And this is a little bit more whimsical, but um, this is the title song of the Emergent show, Emergent, as played on Kitchen uh, uh, items. <laughs> um, <laughs> So you can go ahead and roll this video. This is actually the world premiere of the song. All right, check, check, one, two, check, one, two. How's everybody feeling? Who's ready to do a show? Me too, all right. Well, friends, let's play theater. Lights stand by, lights stand by. Here we go. In five, four, three, two, one, go. Thank you. 
Lights fade me out. Sound close those mics. Thank you very much. We are done. That is it. Great work. Nice. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, thank you. Um, you can run to the next slide. So, so <laughs> this is a really intense slide to come back. To. Uh, I'll breathe together. Uh, yeah, thanks for letting us play uh, both those two songs. Um, we did our best to try to create a kind of like a performance feel for everybody, and hopefully one day. Um, we'll be able to see all of you in person and play that song and play both of those songs on taiko drums in front of you. That would be really great. Um, I think, you know, like I was reflecting on those last lyrics um, that are also very intense, right? Like we end up by asking the audience, where does your heart live? <laughs> and um, this kind of leads into this next slide. I think um, we all know what's happening in the world. Uh, we all know um, the Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and um, George Floyd situations and deaths. Um, I think one way that we have um, tried to also use this philosophy of emergent strategy is to uh, really think about and, and talk about what we can do, what, what our group can do. Um, it might not be much, but it might be something how do we think about uh, these really important moments and how do we think about um, what our role is in the, in the work of anti-racism? So this, we wanted to just close with this because you know, I think it's really important um, to note and we want to make sure that uh, Hoetsu is out there as a resource, as, you know, as somebody that you all know. Uh, we want to engage in these conversations. We want to engage in, in this work. And um, so I'll kick it over to either Dana or Emily to talk about the process or anything you want, the two of you want to talk about. Um, and then, yeah, well, I think we're almost done. We'll have a, a, a Q&A after this. And um, yeah, Dana or Emily. Um, I guess actually kind of following from the emergent strategy method we've used for a lot of other stuff we've done over the last two years. Um, in lieu of everything that has been going on, our group had sat down and talked about if we wanted to put out a statement and if so, what do we want that statement to say? Um, 
as a person of color myself, for me, it was really important, not just for us to say something, but for us to also uh, have committed action that we can point to and say that not only do we believe these things, but this is what we're going to do. Um, so we broke up into teams and uh, each group uh, picked a, an action item that the group would engage in. And so for instance, in self-reflection, we have uh, committed to meeting twice a month to discuss uh, issues of anti-racism, anti-bias, anti-equity, to um, push ourselves to challenge uh, deep-seated biases that we have. Um, on direct advocacy, we are committing to trying to work more with um, uh, social justice groups that align with our values um, and assist them any way that they um, can need, be it us playing or us as volunteers. And on financial equity, um, we have um, changed our pricing structure that will now allow for part of the proceeds that would have been paid to us directly as a group for our performances to actually be paid to a, um, a nonprofit that uh, is aligned with our values, that's doing work that is um, committed to uh, promoting equity, justice, and fairness um, through, especially throughout the city of Chicago, which is where we are, we live and we're uh, focused. And so these are things, and of course this is not um, exhaustive, like there's gonna be so much more that we can do and we will explore those uh, over the rest of our lives. But at least in to start, these are things that we have committed ourselves to doing. And um, hopefully that together with organized people and organized uh, money, we can get to collective power. And if you have any uh, questions, definitely feel free to reach out to our group. Um, and we are more than happy to answer questions, to your thoughts. Um, we really do think this is a community action and we really do want to be part of the broader community and engage in any way that we feel aligns with our values in promoting equity. Um, one other thing is we don't have all the answers. We are also not like the experts in this, but we are trying and we also challenge everybody else that is watching this too, to make some sort of action and step as well as opposed to, as opposed to just making a statement. So um, I think I don't have anything else to say. I think we can wrap up there. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, it's it's been fun. I we don't see the reactions obviously of any of, of you, but uh, thank you all so much for spending this time with us. And um, thank you to the committee. Thank you to Aaron uh, and to Courtney for all your hard work, and to Royce and to Kimiko in the background for doing all the technology. We really, really appreciate it, and we really appreciate being asked to uh, come today to present. Yeah. Okay. I thought they were going to be here. <laughs> wow. Thank you guys so much. That was so wonderful. Incredible. Uh, it's yeah. a lot of food for thought for a fellow Taika player and um, <laughs> really, really beautifully done. Um, and killer stage management and production, Sarah. Incredible. Oh, oh, are we still on? Okay. No, we're rolling. Yeah, we're Great. rolling through these credits. Thank you so much, everyone who performed tonight. Greer, Kurt, Brandon, Miki, Joy for facilitating the census PSA, and Hoetsu Taiko, Hoetsu Taiko, especially Jason, Dana, and Emily. Um, thank Courtney for co-hosting again this week. Thank oh, you, Kimiko thank and Royce. You, <laughs> um, um, next week. Oh, you have it here. We have poetry by Eric Matsunaga, um, or um, a reading um, performance by, well, it's it's not by Dan, actually. It's um, it's a, a reading of um, Dan Kwong and Ruben Guevara, Guevara's uh, Masao and the Bronze Nightingale. Um, we have Kanji and Friends Sing Along. And then we also have um, feature artist Derek Mio from The Terror. And he's going to be bringing some very special guests on um, to talk about Terminal Island. So we hope nice. that you guys will join us. Yeah. And thank you so much for hanging in there tonight. Everyone have a